and just look. Hello, everybody. Are we live, Joyce? Yep. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this Health Plan Forum on Advancing Adolescent Immunization hosted by the California HPV Vaccination Roundtable. My name is Raquel Arias. I'm with the American Cancer Society and a proud member of the leadership team of the California HPV Vaccination Roundtable. So as we were getting started, we want to give just a quick word on the roundtable. Next slide, please. The California HPV Vaccination Roundtable is a coalition of diverse stakeholders work with a mission to work together to prevent HPV-associated cancers and precancers by increasing the California HPV vaccination rate to 80% by 2026. We work to convene stakeholders with, with different roles to play in this space and foster connections among them. And we act as a disseminator of evidence-based strategies and resources. We also execute high impact work that requires collaboration. This is a reference to the work done uh, through our work groups, which you'll see listed on our next slide. So here's how we are structured. We're very grateful to our roundtable steering committee and our leadership team, which is made up of the American Cancer Society, the California Dialogue on Cancer, the CDPH Immunization Coalition, I'm sorry, Immunization Branch and the California Immunization Coalition. And we have roundtable work groups representing our priority areas. You can see them listed on the slide here. And during today's program, we will share a little bit about these work groups and the resources that are available thanks to those work groups. We also have a general membership path. Uh, general members advance HPV vaccination within their own organizations and sphere of influence and assist with roundtable initiatives where possible. Next slide. So thank you all so much for being here. This forum was born out of feedback from our members that we needed to engage more with health plans to really drive this work. As you all know well, health plans play a vital role in advancing adolescent immunization and low HPV vaccination consistently hinders adolescent immunization performance. And of course, on-time vaccination matters. It's a HEDIS measure for a reason. The HPV vaccine can prevent over 90% of cancers caused by HPV when given by age 13. So your health plan has the power to reduce the burden of HPV cancers by motivating members, providers, and your communities to take action to improve HPV vaccination rates. And I do want to say that today's program was put together with a health plan audience in mind, but we also welcome participants that are here because of your work in partnership with plans or your overall interest on this topic. So let's take a look at who's with us. We're excited to have nearly 150 registrants, majority from Medi-Cal health plans, some commercial as well. Also quite a few stakeholders from public health departments and other uh, interested stakeholders. So whatever your role, we welcome you today. Next slide, thank you. Here's our objectives. Um, we are gonna be reviewing the importance of HPV vaccination and where we are with uptake, highlight best practices and evidence-based interventions for health plans to improve HPV vaccination, showcase some examples of health plans doing this work, um, and share resources to support you in um, advancing HPV immunization. And of course, invite you to remain connected to these efforts. We do wanna give a big thank you to the planning team that helped plan today's content, in which included several health plan team members. And it's our hope that you leave today with some fresh ideas and inspiration. And given that this is the first time that we are holding a fo forum like this for a health plan audience, we definitely wanna hear from you about what you thought of today's program, what you want more of. So we will be sharing the evaluation at the end uh, today so you can all provide that feedback. And here is our agenda. In a moment, we'll hear a presentation on HPV vaccination um, updates and best practices for on-time vaccination. We'll briefly hear from Dr. Priya Motes from, um, uh, on about Medi-Cal Medi managed care plan performance. And then um, we'll have a presentation specifically on health plan strategies to promote adolescent HPV vaccination, uh, followed by an exciting panel of uh, different health plans that have been working hard to advance HPV vaccination. Um, we will end with resources and some how to get involved information. 
So a quick housekeeping slide here. Today's forum is being recorded and that recording will be shared along with a PDF copy of, of the slides, of the slides that we've gotten permission to share. Um, please remain muted when not speaking and please use the chat to uh, ask your questions. Time permitting, we may invite um, you all to come off mute to ask questions verbally, but uh, we anticipate that most of the um, question asking will be uh, done through the chat in the interest of time. So please do use that. And then you see how to get in touch with us if you have any general questions, questions after the forum. Okay, before we jump into the meat of our program, we wanna take a moment to remember what this work is all about. HPV infections cause about 37,000 cancers in the US every year. So that's 37,000 real people and whole families impacted. Um, so we're gonna hear from one of them. The sense I had cancer and I just didn't even really know where I was going or what was gonna happen was the most terrifying. When I sat down with doctors and started talking about what it was and what we were gonna do, regardless of the outcome, I didn't think about that. I thought about the plan and what I had to do to get, get through it. Hi, my name is Frank Somers, and I was diagnosed with HPV-derived squamous cell carcinoma on my left tonsil when I was 45 years old. Well, having cancer impacted every part of my life really significantly. Of course, I was young and, and in great health and um, never really had a problem. And all of a sudden, I'm dealing with cancer. and so. Emotionally, that was an incredible blow to feel like I wasn't a young, healthy man anymore. Physically, it was incredibly profound. It lost weight, lost strength, lost focus, ability to do things. It was a real struggle. I had 30 seconds to send a message to everybody in the world about HPV. I think it would be, well, it would simply be awareness. It would be to say, you, you, you need to realize that this is a problem out there, and it's a problem that we can't be shy about or uncouple with. It would be, it, it's a problem that everybody and anybody can have, and the consequences are, are huge. I've had a number of friends with children, as a result of me, who have decided to get educated about it, who have become aware of, of the problem, and then have gone and vaccinated their children. To me, I can't, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't do it at all. If you could vaccinate someone and potentially eliminate what I went through, it just, it wouldn't be a question. Okay, thank you to Frank and other survivors like him that share their stories to help advance this important work. I do want to mention that this video is a couple years old, so you may have noticed at the end that 11 to 12 um, recommendation was noted, but the American Cancer Society has since 2020 recommended the HPV vaccine at ages 9 to 12. And you'll hear more about this uh, during our next presentation. So now I hear a little bit of background noise. If you all can make sure that you're muted. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kristen Oliver for a presentation on HPV vaccination updates and best practices for on-time vaccination. Dr. Oliver is a pediatrician and public health specialist. She's currently an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health and Pediatrics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Oliver's scholarly and research interests focus on quality improvement for vaccination and vaccine hesitancy. She represents the American Academy of Pediatrics on the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable and serves as a tri-chair. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Oliver. The floor is yours. Great, excellent. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Let me just get this started. Okay, so we're gonna talk, um, and as fast as I can today, about um, some updates on HPV vaccination and best practices to make sure that we're getting every opportunity um, to prevent this cancer in the patients that we see. I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose, but I always disclose this, which is I love vaccines. And the vaccine I love the most really is HPV vaccine. And I'm uh, hoping that by the end of this talk, you'll share my love for HPV vaccine and understand a little bit better why. 
Um, so I think as was mentioned in the introduction, we associate HPV vaccine with cervical cancer. And as CDC says, that's really just the tip of the iceberg, though. There's over 10,000 cases of cervical cancer every year. 4,000 women die a year from cervical cancer. Um, but that is an underestimation of all the disease that's caused by HPV. So you have these 300,000 women who end up having high-grade cervical lesions as a result of HPV disease, and then all the other cancers that come along, as we heard from the survivor video, oropharyngeal cancer, as well as anal cancer, vulvar and vaginal cancer, and penile cancer, all of which can be prevented with the HPV vaccine. And and I think it, you know, it took a while before we had real end data on the effectiveness of the vaccine in preventing actual cancer. So the trials happened and showed that they had good um, antibody response and good um, impact in terms of preventing infection. And then we had evidence that it was preventing precancers. And now in the last five or so years, we've had evidence that it really actually prevents cervical cancer and other cancers. So just a quick example of some of the great data we have on this now. Um, and so the, but the other thing to remember in terms of looking at the effectiveness of the HPV vaccine is that it's more effective if you get it on time um, and on time by age 13. And so you can see here, this is a, a large cohort study looking um, in England at people who got vaccinated at 12 to 13. And the effectiveness against precancer was 97%, effectiveness against cervical cancer, 87%. Um, those who got vaccinated at 14 to 16, that effectiveness drops down 75% and 62%. And then even later for getting the vaccine 16 to 18, um, dropping to 39% and 34%. So yes, it is absolutely still worth giving at these ages. You still want to prevent as much cancer as possible. But to do the best job this vaccine can do, you want to get it in by 12 to 13. And the reason for that is because it takes time for these cancers to develop. At ages 10, 11, 12, there's almost no rates of genital HPV infection. This is United States data now. Um, but starting at 13 in green, you see, you see the genital HPV infection. And then it takes years before cervical cancer, precancers develop, and even longer before you see this peak in cervical cancers. But if we vaccinate here, you're going to prevent all these downstream consequences, right, from the infection, the precancer, and the cancer. And what we really want to do is get this vaccine in here before 13, when you start to see um, the acquisition of HPV infection. Um, and a lot of times when I talk to my other colleagues, pediatricians, who say like, ah, you know what, my patients aren't sexual activity before 13. Like, we don't have a predictive tool for that. Right? There is no app that can tell me which patients are more at risk. What you want to do is prevent it in every single patient, um, regardless of what, how you're profiling them. And so I think really important to try to do this for every child before age 13. I think everyone um, is probably familiar with how safe HPV vaccine is, but I think it always bears repeating. There is so much data on HPV vaccine out there. It's been studied for so long. Um, 109 studies and over 2.5 million people, six different countries, no serious side effects. Things that we typically expect for vaccines, certainly an allergic reaction, um, fainting, um, not as a result from what's in the vaccine, but from actually getting the injection, um, as well as some soreness in the arm. And that's it. Um, I think important to, to remind all of us um, and feel really comfortable with the amount of really great safety data we have. So when I tell other colleagues, when I tell patients, when I tell friends and families, yes, this vaccine is really safe, um, I have a lot of data backing me up on that. But despite how effective it is, despite how safe it is, we are here because we know that the rates of, for HPV vaccination are not where we want them to be, and we need to do better. So um, this is data from the National Immunization Survey that CDC puts out every year. Um, I have to say that they put it out at the end of August every year, and the date, most recent data came out um, last week, right after I had to submit these slides for clearance. So this data is um, a little out of date, but the really sort of bad news is that in looking at the most recent data, overall, trends have basically stayed flat. Um, so it's, there's not... Um, Go anywhere. So oh, for three days... Um, I think somebody's unmuted, um, but right, we haven't gone anywhere with HPV vaccination rates, and that's what we're trying to affect. So the national average is around 76% in 2022. Um, and then looking here, just noting that there is a lot of geographic variation across the United States. The darker shade are states that have higher coverage, the lighter states that have uh, lower coverage. And as you probably also know in California, within states, we also see geographic variation, right? So there's gonna be parts of the state with higher and parts of the state with lower. 
We can look specifically at California now. Again, this is NIS teen data um, from 2022. And what you can see here in the green and blue at the very top, in green is Tdap, so tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, and the blue is meningococcal. The two other vaccines that are also recommended around the same time period at age 11 to 12, but are you know, required for school in most states. You can see these rates are much higher than what we've got for one dose of HPV, which is here in orange, um, and HPV up to date, being two to three doses, depending on what age them the child started at. And so really a lot of room for improvement here. And noting that this is the data for ages 13 to 17. So you've got some, you know, those really we want this by 13. And when you look by 13, it is um, even lower. So here we are. And this is from California's own immunization information system registry. Data here by age 13, initiation rate um, for 13 year olds in California in 2023 was 67%, up to date rates, completion rate of 43%. Um, and then broken down by urbanicity and rural, what we see also across the United States is rates are, tend to be higher in urban areas than they are in rural areas. And that's happening both for initiation, although not huge, um, and in particular for up-to-date rates too. So getting everyone back in for that second and, and potentially the third dose if they started um, after age 15. Other characteristics and Differences we see across HPV vaccination rates higher, this is specific, California specific, but consistent with the US, higher among adolescents who are living below poverty um, in green here compared to those living at or above poverty. And that's both for initiation as well as completion. Um, and rates are lowest for Californian adolescents who identify as white here in green compared to black and blue, Hispanic, and then other or multiple races in green. And you can see those trends um, a little bit slightly reverse for the up-to-date rate, but for initiation, that um, lowest among uh, Californians who identify as white. Okay, so how do we increase rates? Because we know we need to. Um, and it's it's things that we know are effective. There's lots and lots of studies that prove this, um, but we just have to make it happen every single time. So the number, number one thing is the strong provider recommendation. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a minute, but basically making sure that whether it's a pediatrician, a family medicine doc, a nurse practitioner, and every other single person in the office, right? Not just the healthcare provider, but the front desk, the medical assistant who's rooming that patient and answering the questions um, gives this strong recommendation. Um, and it's, it's sort of saying like, today is your child is due for the HPV vaccine. Do you have any questions for me, right? Uh, and the next thing, and the best way to put sort of essentially, um, put that strong recommendation into your practice is a standing order. Often people will have these for flu vaccines, right? It's just a, a way for um, there not to have to be a very a specific order every time there's a patient uh, encounter in order to get the vaccine ordered. So it's just anytime we see someone, you know, between the ages of nine and 26 who's due for the vaccine, they can get it. That means they can get it um, before they're actually seen by the physician or the nurse practitioner. Um, and it's very great data that this really does increase um, coverage rates within a practice. Other things we do for to increase rates for all vaccines and really is effective for HPV2 is reminder recall. So this is just reminding, as it sounds like, our parents to let them know your child is due for a specific vaccine. Um, and this works through phone calls. It works if it's a, it works if it's um, a, a letter. It works if it's a postcard. It works with text messages, right? So letting parents know that their child is due or overdue for a vaccine, including HB vaccine is also effective. And then finally provider, provider prompts, reminding the provider which children are due for which vaccines. And so this can be an, an EMR pop-up. Um, this can be someone, you know, before they room the patient, looking at the child's immunization record, printing that out and highlighting the, the vaccines that the child is due for and laying that on, on the provider's computer, on a sticky note. All of these things are effective in increasing immunization rates and pretty straightforward to do. Um, I think often people, you know, we're always looking for some exciting new thing that we can do to increase rates. Um, but the, what, the not exciting things really do work. It's just we have to keep it up. 
Uh, I'm going to dig in for a, a quickly about the strong recommendation, specifically the idea of the announcement approach. So this is where you say, for instance, Marcus is nine, so today he'll get a vaccine that prevents six different cancers. You're essentially announcing as the provider what's going to happen um, in the visit. And this is in contrast to an approach that some people use like, okay, so what do you want to do about the HPV vaccine today? Or my least favorite, which I hear a lot is, okay, so you need the Tdap and meningococcal vaccine for school. Um, HPV isn't required for school, but we still recommend it. Do you want to get it today? Like, how does that sound as a parent, right? You're like, okay, well, this may not be that important. Um, and so really making this announcement, this is what's due today. This is the evidence-based standard of care. And I compare it to, you know, today we're trying, we're going to do hearing and vision testing today. I don't say like, do you want the hearing or the vision or both? Right? I mean, this is the standard of care. This is what we do. Um, and so make, having the same approach with vaccines, really, really great evidence that this increases immunization rates um, within a practice. That said, it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Um, and so some parents are going to have questions and that's absolutely reasonable. You wanna identify their specific concern and answer their question. The most, another really important thing to remember here is that if a parent, and also I think a lot of you are doing probably having interactions with other providers and provider groups, um, as well as other office staff, remembering that even if a parent initially declines to keep trying again nicely at subsequent visits, almost 70% of parents who initially decline later agree to HPV vaccine or really plan too soon. And so I think that's important to remember. Um, I, I compare it to, and I do preventive medicine, so I do tobacco cessation in adults too, um, I compare it to tobacco cessation. Like if I ask the patient if they're you know ready to quit, should we make a quit plan? And they say, no, I'm not going to not ask about it at the next visit, right? This is what we need to do to keep them, uh, protect them from getting cancer. And it's the same thing with the HPV vaccine. I'm going to bring it up at every visit. And I say that to my patients who, you know, and say like, you know, I'm going to bring this up again next time. I'm like, yes, we know. Okay. And so it's not a conflict, um, but it is just uh, reminding them that this is important. And there's a lot of great material on this announcement approach available um, through this HPV IQ. The group out of um, UNC Chapel Hill was Noel Brewer. This brings us to here's the sort of fun little thing that we can start to do. Um, and that's starting to give these strong recommendations and doing all the reminder and recall at age nine rather than waiting until age 11 to 12. And so um, I like to say, don't waste time, start at nine. Um, and so just a reminder that this recommendation is consistent with ACIP, the American College for Immunization Practices um, Committee, sorry, and CDC's recommendation on vaccine for HPV. So routine vaccination, 11 to 12, but here it can be started at age nine. So completely consistent with CDC. The catch up, if you're late, is 13 to 26, and then the, the shared clinical decision for older. So just it makes, I think often there's questions about this. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Cancer Society recommend routine starting at age nine, um, and but CDC absolutely can be started at age nine. This is consistent with their recommendation. And I sort of I think it's helpful to sort of talk through why I started doing age nine, and it was a long time ago now, um, probably getting into seven years ago. So when I at that time I was practicing in, in I was in, in, still in New York City, but practicing at our school based health center. So these are regular pediatric clinics just embedded in this case in an elementary school in East Harlem in New York City. Um, and you know this is a we're, we're there in the school based health center because the a lot of children in this community don't otherwise have great access um, to a regular provider. And so and I was in an elementary school so it only went through fifth grade. Most but not all of those kids turned 11 by the time they were in fifth grade, but then they graduated to middle school. And I didn't know what their access to care was going to be after that, right? Some of them are, you know, most of them are on Medicaid. Some of them are um, uninsured or that, uh, the rare in New York City. Um, and a lot of them had, you know, really, really complicated family lives. It was in parents working numbers of different jobs and hard to get them into care um, during regular hours. And so the school-based health center really provides a needed service. I didn't know once they graduated what their access to care was going to be. And I did not want to miss a group of kids who I could prevent cancer in by, wait, by having to wait until they were 11 to 12. And so we really started offering the vaccine at 9 to 10. Um, and so that, that way I knew I would have a much better chance of catching everybody before they left this great care that we were providing them. And this sort of you know, idea about missed opportunities is consistent with what we see in terms of well child checks in the country. Less than half of adolescents are gonna have a well child check every year. And so if you're, and 
new data coming out looking at you know how often kids have a well child check at nine to ten, but then do not have one at eleven to twelve. So there's a real missed opportunity there if you've got somebody at age nine or age ten who's eligible for HPV vaccine, but you don't offer it to them. Um, and so that's really one of the main reasons that I started doing it. And then I, another reason was that, and this is I've gotten in trouble for saying this before. I love vaccines. I don't actually love giving the injection. And so I'm in my school-based health center where there was no nurse. It was just me and a medical assistant. I'm doing, I'm drawing them all up. I'm administering them. And I didn't love giving four shots um, to an 11-year-old in the same visit, right? Because we were doing Tdap, meninge, HPV, and flu usually. And it just, right? So if I could get some of those done earlier, absolutely, I wanted to be able to do that. I mean, a lot of times the kids really wanted to, too. And I just would point out, this is different than spacing the childhood immunization series, right? That is not recommended. But here we have HPV, which can be given at nine or 10, fully within the recommendation. So sort of a different thing. And I will say that I'm not alone in this, that a quarter of providers have reported being unwilling to give more than two shots per visit. I'll clarify that I'm not unwilling, but I would certainly prefer um, to not have to do that. And so that was another reason that was sort of driving me to start offering at nine to 10. And then it turned out it just worked. Um, it was easier. The parents were saying, yes, I found I wasn't talking as much about sex in the conversations around um, HPV vaccine and cancer prevention. I could really focus on the cancer prevention. The nine to 10 year olds weren't as developed, right? And so the parents aren't quite thinking of them yet as, as being sexually active, the way it was sort of different for an 11 to 12 year old, somebody about to go to middle school. So it really, um, I, I found it really really worked and was so easy. This has been, you know, not just me who's had this experience. Some data here that I'm showing now is just an example of a group out in Washington state who started a quality improvement project to start offering vaccination at nine to 10. And so you can see a baseline here on the percent of kids who had a well child visit and then got HPV vaccine before they started this 10% of nine-year-olds, 25% of 10-year-olds. And then after their intervention, they're at 39% for nine-year-olds, 91% for 10-year-olds acceptance. And then by year four, 85 and 86% are getting vaccinated um, at ages nine and 10, which to me really does demonstrate this is acceptable to parents. Um, and I, when I've done some learning collaboratives with other pediatricians around this, they let's just, you know, try it once to see how the next couple of patients go. And they'll come back at the next, you know, meeting that we have for the learning collaborative and be like, oh my gosh, that was so easy. Like it was so much easier than the, nine, the 11 to 12 conversation. Um, and so I think there really is, you know, both anecdotal as well as some good published evidence that this works. All right, there we go. Um, a question that I get a lot from providers is that is the question about um, duration of immunity for the HPV vaccine. And what if I'm giving it at nine to 10, is it really gonna continue to protect these patients um, well throughout into their adult years? And the answer for that in this very data full slide is absolutely yes. So you can see um, that this, the, the immune response from for all the different strains of HPV, you get this initial drop, which we expect right after a vaccine, and then it really continues and goes on and on and on. And so we've got really great data now um, on duration of immunity. And as this is, I took this directly from the American Academy of Pediatrics, it seems to last a lifetime, so it cannot be too early to vaccinate. And I think that's um, a really important message that we don't always um, get out there in particular to, um, to providers who, it's a reasonable question. Um, we have enough data now on this vaccine, it's been around for so long um, that we can be really comfortable that this is going to provide um, a lot of protection for a long time. I will just note that the AAP updated their immunization schedule um, in 2019 to start recommending HPV vaccination routinely at nine. So you can see here, it's a nice visual. So it starts at nine and goes through age 12. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've, all of you have worked with Sherry Zorn. She's a pediatrician in Washington state and she does some really neat projects looking at um, actually how helpful it is to have these immunization schedules up um, in, in the exam rooms. Um, and so then that, that way the providers are just pointing to the schedule, they're like, here, 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 you're nine years old, time for, let's go time for HPV and we can give you a flu vaccine today. It's, it's on the poster. Um, and a lot of providers say, you know, this is so, I don't know why we didn't have this poster before. It's so easy um, when it's right there. And so I think thinking about using some resources um, where it's specifically denoted to start at nine can be really helpful too, if, if you're thinking about um, what kind of projects you can be working with, with the providers that you're serving. That said, I just do want to clarify, age nine is not the magic bullet, right? We are not going to solve this entire um, 
problem of trying to get higher uh, HPV vaccination rates across the country um, just by starting at age nine. I think it certainly can help, but what we really need to do is take all of these different pieces that we know work, but start them at age nine and doing it for every kind of visit. So that means not just well child checks, that means doing it um, at sick visits, it means doing it on medication, ADHD med refill visits, right? Looking at all the different potential missed opportunities where we could be starting the vaccine continuing um, and completing the series. And you don't need to see my extra slides. So I will stop there and can answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliver, for that informative presentation. Um, as a reminder to everybody, you can drop your questions for Dr. Oliver in the chat. We do actually have time if somebody wants to come off mute to ask a question, but I will get it started. Um, Dr. Oliver, can you speak to like what, uh, as far as starting at age nine, what some of the more logistical components, like what would need to happen at the health system level, at the practice level to actually make that move? Yep. I think one of the things we've seen uh, it's really important to do is just make sure there's some education component all of this stuff at the beginning before you start any of the uh, initiatives. So no, it, getting the message out there, hey, that is why we're doing this. I do think those survivor stories in my practice at Mount Sinai, we had a um, real big um, proponent of HPV vaccine and that really ramped everybody up. So making sure everyone's on board, providing some of this inf specific information around age nine, it's consistent with the CDC ACIP recommendation. It's covered by insurance, right? But we, we are comfortable with the duration of immunity and making sure everybody gets that message and then saying, here are the missed opportunities. If we're not starting at nine to 10, this is why we're going to do this. If you have some baseline data, I think that's going to be really helpful. Like here are our rates at nine to 10, here's 11 to 12. We need to, we want to be here by 13. And then this is one of our, our strategies for doing this. And then you can do everything you're already doing, hopefully. Um, so you want to put your prompts to age nine instead of 11 to 12, the reminders. Um, I think using the, um, the posters is a really great idea and a great tool as, as well. Some states are already forecasting, saying like child is due for HPV at age nine. So if you're in one of those states, I don't know where California is on that. Um, that can be helpful too. But you can certainly have your EMR. If you're in EPIC, there is a way for EPIC to start doing that. Thank you. It cut out a bit for me at the beginning, but I think we got it with the making sure to include that educational component. And yeah, just to speak to where we are with the forecasting at age nine, uh, Jane Gray, keep me honest here, but we do have forecasting at age nine in our registry. It shows as um, due, not overdue. Correct, Jane? Can you come off mute and speak to that? Yes, uh, you beat me to it. I was about to put something in the chat, but happy to talk to the group. But yes, our um, state IIS, the California Immunization Registry, does forecast starting at nine, as you described Raquel saying that it is due. Um, but yeah, it does not show overdue until I think, oh, no, I'm trying to remember, I think 13 for overdue. Do is great. Um, and one of the things I did was I would pr I'd print out our, so we are the same thing, our IIS for New York City, because it says due, and then highlight the ones they're due for, and then show that to the family, right? It's like, here we go. It's it seems similar to the poster. It's written on paper. Um, I think that's just sort of similar to the announcement approach. This is the standard of care. This is what we do. Um, it's, it's very helpful, especially for me in a school setting where people knew they were coming in for the school required, didn't necessarily know that HPV was there and you could you know, show they all looked the same um, on the report. And hi, Jane. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Oliver, either? Um... Come off, you're welcome to come off mute and drop it in the chat. Okay, well, thank you so much again, Dr. Oliver. We really appreciate you taking the time to join our forum today, giving of your time and expertise um, to help support these health plans as they're doing this important work. So thank you and have a wonderful rest of the day. And now you got to get back to your, your day job. My pleasure. Thanks so much for all the work that you're doing in California. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay, everybody. Well, Dr. Oliver did touch on some estimates of how we're doing. Oh, and now we got a question in the chat. <laughs> if Dr. Uh, Oliver is still on, sorry, I haven't gotten a chance to read that question, but Dr. Oliver, if you're still on, please take a look at the chat. Um, but I want to mention that um, Dr. Oliver touched on some estimates of how we're doing on HPV uptake. And so we wanted to also include an update on Medi-Cal um, managed care plan performance. So for this update, we are happy to have with us from the Department of Healthcare Services, Dr. Priya Motes. She's currently a branch chief within the Department of Healthcare Services, where she predominantly focuses on improving health equity, public health initiatives, and quality of care for Medi-Cal members. Her background includes over 10 years of clinical experience, including serving as a physician in the United States Air Force and developing healthcare policies. In her spare time, when she's not spending it with her husband and running her two boys to their various after-school programs and sports, she enjoys woodworking, very interesting, hiking, and eating delicious foods. Thank you, Dr. Motes, for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Good. Good morning, everyone, and, and thanks for letting me join this this great session. That was, was a great discussion earlier, so appreciate it. Enjoy the next slide. The next slide. Thanks. Perfect. So today we're kind of kind of recap on what we do at the Department of Healthcare Services. How do we assess HPV vaccination rates, as well as some of our big focus areas that we track every year? Enjoy the next slide, please. Perfect. And so the first thing I'll touch on is the managed care accountability set, which is essentially a set of performance measures that the department tracks every year. And in this, our, with as we partner with our uh, Medi-Cal managed care plans who calculate these rates out on various quality metrics that really kind of assess quality, accessibility, and timeliness of care that are provided to our members, we try to partner with them and see how we can improve these rates, build out, and um, work together, collaborating uh, ac across our, our platforms to see how we can improve these, this set of quality measures. Go to the next slide, please. And what and how we assess these set of these quality measures, the MCAS, I'll say for short, is we have set targets that we uh, are, are we we try to have our Medi-Cal managed care plans meet, and um, and those are called the minimum performance level, which is the 50th percentile, the national median for these various measures, as well as we also have set sort of our our ultimate goal, which is the high performance levels, and those are 90th percentiles, and again national nationally calculated uh, percentiles, and r really if if our plans fall shy of the minimum performance level, the department is able to um, impose sanctions as well as um, we collaborate again with our, our plans to build out quality and health equity improvement efforts to help improve the rates so that they can meet that minimum performance level. Go to the next slide, please. And the MCAS, it really does align with our comprehensive quality strategy report, which we released in 2022. And in that report, it's a three-year plan that we kind of lay out there and really assess where do we need to focus on as a state? Where do we see our Medi-Cal managed care plans needing that extra or demonstrating opportunities for improvement? And so when we looked at our data back in 2022, we kind of laid out a, an idea of where we saw those big those big clinical focus areas, and that really focused on children's preventative services, reproductive health, as well as behavioral health uh, tra transformation integration within our um, within our providers and our service areas. And you can see here that we also sort of, and with those clinical focus areas, we broke down the what we call the bold goals initiative, which is the idea is hopefully we can make some improvements by the measurement year 2025. Uh, so all throughout next year, kind of collecting that data to see how we can work on, on, on these set of measures. You can see here, one of the big ones, again, is really kind of our focus on children's preventative care, looking at our infant as well as all the through our adolescent uh, well visits, kind of making imp making improvements on those areas, as well as child and adolescent immunizations, where we see a large need and are partnering with our various um, state partners as well. It's kind of really looking at those and working together and improving them. And then blood lead and developmental screening too, as, as well as that we've seen as important. Uh, factors for our children, preventive service or preventive care. And, and I, I won't go through the reproductive care there, but we can you can see here we also track cervical cancer screening rates and uh, cervical cancer uh, screen prevention rates, and um, as well as some repro other reproductive care measures as well. Go to the next slide, please. And this is all the MCAS rates. 
uh, here as well. And you can see here the the orange colored measures are potentially measures we were thinking are thinking about adding for to next year. Uh, but the the back black bolded measures are the ones that we currently track for this year, measurement year 2024. You can see here that one of the measures is immunizations for adolescents combination two. And what that measure is, it's it, IMA for short, it tracks um, at the age of 13, what it's measuring is at when adolescents are at age of 13, have they gotten their one dose of meningococcal vaccine, one Tdap, and have completed the series for HPV vaccination? And so that is a measure that really sort of gets down to those sort of a combination of those those three sets. By age 13, have all of our adolescents met that marker? And we'll kind of go into a little bit of the, the uh, data of that measure itself during this talk. Through the next slide, please. And then this is just a continuation of those other measures that we track as well annually in chronic disease management, behavioral health um, um, outcomes as well. Go to the next slide, please. So we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive here, and I'll drop, or I'll drop the health disparities report where this information has come from. And, and this, this data is from measurement year 2022, so a little older. We are um, updating our for measurement your 2023 data, we've just gotten that and looking at it, making sure it's valid as we kind of build out what those rates look like for um, as, as we from last year as well. We can see here as we kind of break it down by race ethnicity where we see our disparities for this immunization. And in, again, IMA2 is a combo of those three. And you can definitely see we have opportunities for improvement with our among our tribal partners, as well as our Black or African American members, and um, as well as our um, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islanders. You can see the comparison of the data here, blue being 2021 data, and that yellowish orange color being our 2022 uh, data for, from uh, the, just a comparison of those two. You can see we kind of dropped a little bit in some of these um, in some of our populations. And so kind of looking at that, what do we need to do? How can we better make improvements on that effort as we go forward? Go to the next slide, please. And this is a capture. Again, I'll drop the report just in case anybody wants to do a deeper dive on, on it in, in, um, in, in general. But this is just a quick snapshot uh, of it, one of the maps that we will kind of assess assessing. And then the blue is sort of what it is. And this is for our white population uh, and, you know, Based on the numbers, you can see here that it gets pretty suppressed. And it's the reason why we couldn't do maps for a lot of our race ethnicity groups, just because the numbers get really suppressed and small to make a good comparison. But just even looking at this, for example, you can kind of see where we see those gaps are. The white, complete, uh, colorless uh, counties are suppressed uh, just for um, low numbers, low numerator data and, and denominator data. But as you kind of see here, we definitely... Uh, have large, uh, a great opportunity for improvement throughout the state. We do see pockets of um, lower immunization rates, some of our frontier counties as well. Of, of how do we reach them? How do we provide better education and um, just engagement with our members to ensure that they're getting in for those immunizations? The green um, and grayish red map, that's just comparing the counties to one another. And you can kind of see here which counties maybe be falling a little low. And I'll not get right now. Do the next slide, please. All right, so when we, uh, for IMA2, uh, I just wanted to put here what that minimum performance level was for measurement year 2022. You can see it was 35% national median of, of this, this um, combo. And the high performance in that 90th percentile national again was 48.42%. As a state, average was higher than the minimum performance level, so higher than that 50th percentile as an aggregate of all the combos together. I'm sorry, as, as the combo is one. Uh, but again, when you you know, as we saw, even though the the statewide weighted average is higher than that minimum performance level, we do see areas where we where we definitely have the disparities and are trying to build up on that. And how can we work on that as well? Okay, then we can go to the next slide where we kind of break it out by antigen. Perfect. And so you can see here, right, meningococcal, seventy nine percent. This is all statewide aggregated data. Tdap 89%, really high. But when you look at our HPV, completion of the series by age of 13 
it's 42%. It's definitely a measure that we see a great opportunity to improve upon for IMA2. And you can really see where, you know, when we compare, right, where are, are, are our children getting in for immunizations? Are they able to get access to it? And you can see here that they're getting in because they're getting meningococcal, they're getting Tdap. But in, in granted, those are just one doses. And so it is uh, interesting when we break it out by antigen that HPV is tends to be just half of our, our percentage for as compared to the other two. And so definitely an area where we can kind of work together, get together and collaborate to kind of get those improvements. We do see that with a series, a um, series of vaccinations, for example, influenza in our younger pop in our infants, that when it, it is broken out, when it's more than one immunization to complete the series, for example, as an HPV, depending on age, that we do see lower um lower rates for that, you know, maybe they get one immunization. Do they get the second one? When do they get that? Do they get a third one depending on their age? But since this is before 13. And so this is where we really do kind of say, like, how do we bring our members back? When it is, how do we make it a little bit easier for them to come? Go to the next slide, please. This is just some info. And again, I'll drop the, um, just some helpful sites. So we we leverage ourselves at the Department of Healthcare Services quite a bit. And I'll drop in the health disparities report to the chat too, um, as, as a potential reference. And again, we'll be updating that info too. But I'll pause there and, and just open it up to questions. Sorry, it took me a minute to come off mute there. Thank you so much, Dr. Motes. I uh, very much appreciate your update. Um, let's see, in the chat, please I encourage everybody to put some questions in the chat or you can come off mute, maybe just raise your hand. The question that we have is a bit off topic, but we're gonna ask it. That some um, Someone's mentioning that they noticed some measures are noted as anticipated to be MCAS measures in 2025. Will DHCS be announcing any changes to these anticipated measures? Yes, we we that's it is a topic, but um yes those those measures that are in that orange color are possible measures. We always flat we like to flag a year in advance of what potentially will move to to what we call accountable rather than just reporting out where we will hold plants to that minimum performance level. Those as you may may have observed those measures are predominantly. They have a little E next to it, so they're electronically captured, and that is definitely an infrastructure we're still working on built and building um, a little bit more up so we can get accurate capture of that information. So it's um, for those measures right now, the numbers are so small, and we know what that the, the validity of that data is not actually being captured, what's actually happening on the ground. And so we're a little hesitant at this time to move some of those EC, e electronic measures up to accountable. But it'll go, it usually send it out for public comment to uh, on that list and get, get feedback too, just to see how, how it's landed. Thank you. And I do see that you've dropped the health disparities report in the chat. Thank you. Okay, last call for questions and you're welcome to come off mute. I'll give a minute. Okay, I always move too fast, but I counted. So <laughs> I hope I gave her enough time. Thank you so much, Dr. Motes. We really appreciate you joining us, um, really supporting these efforts. And um, if anyone else has questions, come to them. Hopefully, Dr. Motes, you can hang on a couple extra minutes or for the rest of our program, if you're able to, um, and, and be active in the chat. Okay. So we are going to um, invite you all to just take a quick stretch. We're at about uh, close to the halfway point here. So um, I, I wish I could get up with you. You know, I'm not going to do HPV yoga, but I do suggest you Google it because it's a great time. It's a great way to um, get a stretch and on topic with today's uh, talk. And for our next portion, our second portion of our program, we are going to focus specifically on health plan strategies. So we will begin with a presentation from Dr. Jennifer Sway on health plan strategies to promote adolescent HPV vaccination. She's going to be reviewing some lessons learned and future opportunities. And then after her presentation, Dr. Sway will lead us into our panel of health plan speakers so we can hear directly from health plans implementing these strategies. And we've got, we're doing well on time. So we have got uh, a good opportunity to, to hear from those plans. 
So it's my pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Jennifer Sway. She's an associate professor in the Department of Population and Public Health Sciences at the Keck School of Medicine at USC and Cancer Control Program co-leader and director of Cancer Care Delivery Research and Implementation Science at USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. She is a health services researcher and implementation scientist with a focus on reducing inequities in cancer prevention and control through implementation of evidence-based strategies and health system, community, and policy level interventions, particularly among marginalized populations serving safety net uh, healthcare settings. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sway, for being with us today. Take it away. Thank you so much, Raquel. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Great. And um, I love being here with this group. And just thank you so much for the California HPV Vaccine Roundtable for setting this up. I am super excited for what is to follow after my brief set of slides. I can't wait to hear from our esteemed panelists in a few minutes. So I think my job here today, um, following those two great speakers that just came before me, um, is to set the stage a little bit. I think we've heard sort of from the national perspective, we just got some um, perspective around the IMA rates here in California. And so I'll just jump in a little bit about what are current health plan strategies um, to promote adolescent HPV vaccination, some lessons learned um, in recent years, and potentially lots of future opportunities here in California to lead the way for innovative health plan um, strategies and, and focus on HPV vaccination. So really quickly, we know um, nearly all of our kids in California um, have insurance and approximately 43% of California children are on Medi-Cal. So we have this opportunity to work with many of our Medi-Cal plans here in the state um, and, and to have those plans have the potential to reduce the burden of HPV associated cancers, improve vaccination rates overall for adolescents, particularly for HPV, decrease long-term disease and related costs, and to reach multiple parts of the healthcare system, um, as well as community partners and community outreach strategies. So how do we do that, right? We know that we can increase HPV vaccination by focusing on the IMA2 performance um, through member, provider, and system level strategies. Next slide. So this is a study that we've been working on here at USC over the last couple of years that's been funded by the National Cancer Institute. And it really was to take sort of an assessment of what multi-level factors go into identifying evidence-based strategies to address, improve, and promote adolescent HPV vaccination in safety net settings, settings serving um, medically underserved populations. In that first part of the study, um, which I'll get to in the next slide, we really dive deep into stakeholder perspectives um, from the community level, patient, parent level, as well as um, health plans and policymakers. So I'm going to focus on that just for the next slide or so. There are other findings from that study, and hopefully there are other venues where we can talk about um, some of what we've been doing with our clinic partners and the round table. So in that first stakeholder assessment, when we focused on payer and policy strategies to improve adolescent HPV vaccination, we found that there were both existing barriers and lots of potential opportunities. So one, I saw there were minor consent questions in the chat already. We found region specific policies that either limited access or limited coverage to the vaccine. One is when whether minor consent laws exist, what age they start, and what age we're targeting HPV vaccination. So thinking around opportunities for that is one example. There are competing priorities. We know that um, healthcare settings have multiple competing priorities at this time. Um, when we were doing this part of the study, um, the COVID vaccines were just rolling out. That was both an opportunity to refocus on adolescent vaccines, as well as a huge barrier as, as settings, as healthcare settings were sort of ramping up um, with vaccine delivery for COVID. There's also targeting of HPV vaccination within clinic provider and member priorities, right? Where do you focus on? How many of these levels do you focus on? 
And at what stage are are individual clinics and individual FQHCs, for example, ready to do some of these evidence-based strategies? So whether it's focusing on specific HPV vaccine monitoring, whether it's focusing on getting those first dose initiation shots or second and third dose completion rates, um, whether there's the ability to have provider metrics in place, right? Individual feedback and audit for different provider teams. And then thinking about how do we engage specific members, parents with adolescents that are age eligible in that target nine to 12 age range and increasing community level awareness. Um, and lastly, just how, how do we come out of that pandemic thinking about increasing sort of increased sensitivity around vaccines, but also this new infrastructure around vaccination partners and delivering strategies. So if you want to hear more about what we learned and sort of how that shaped some of what we've done in our work, um, there's a QR code there so you can get to that paper. Slide. So some of these slides are from, from the round table. We wanted to kind of set the stage on what data can tell us. I think the last presentation primed this so perfectly. We know that meningococcal and Tdap rates are higher across the state. And so one, one way to look at the data is how HPV is comparing to the other adolescent vaccines in individual clinics and health systems and plans. Next step, next slide. Another way is to compare how completion for HPV is doing in relation to vaccine initiation for HPV. So thinking through are the strategies um, mainly, do the strategies mainly need to focus on getting those kids back and the reminders around the time to get them back for second doses. Next step. And then lastly, you can increase completion without focusing on initiation. So a lot of it is understanding where the baseline is for individual settings, individual systems, um, different member groups, et cetera. Next slide. So tailoring intervention strategies, right? That's a lot of where I started with our, our NCI study is understanding what is needed at that local level, um, whether it's focusing on initiation efforts, um, to minimize the gap between HPV and other adolescent vaccines. So that could be provider trainings that's starting earlier for age nine, pro provider and member reminders for the first dose, and then al also that audit and feedback. Now, if there's already high initiation, then the focus is on completion, right? What are the systems in place, workflows in place to get provider providers to focus on that second dose and members to come back for that second dose. I know we might hear about some strategies and lessons learned around member incentives on the panel. So that, that's one option. And then I think with all of our um, sort of healthcare access, health equity um, research areas and care delivery areas right now, it's addressing those structural barriers. So providing additional vaccine opportunities, reducing missed opportunities, figuring out who other vaccination partners might be in non-traditional settings. So these are all ways to tailor when you have high initiation and but low completion. So this is from the community guide. These are some recommended evidence-based interventions for increasing HPV vaccination. And I think the, the great part about HPV vaccination is that we've seen lots of strategies that are now effective and, and widely disseminated. And I think um, the, the sort of phase or the lesson learns about what we've done in the field in recent years is figuring out which of these fit best according to the context and the target um, communities that, that individual plans, individual health systems, or um, clinic sites specifically may be serving. So there is that sort of um, tailoring and identification of which strategies from this menu might work best in your target populations. And then just implementation elements to consider, right? These are static sort of process. These are these are these are moving 
processes, right? There's context that changes. There are other um, policies that come into place. So I think thinking through implementation elements and, and how to adapt along the way is critical to sustainability and long-term success. So uh, focusing on equity, um, equitable access to the vaccine at multiple levels, having a multidisciplinary team, um, multiple champions, for example, at the clinic level or the health plan level, um, engagement with internal and external partners, the importance of context. Um, I mentioned earlier, not all of these strategies are ready for, for um, individual settings. Some strategies may, may be um, a better fit for some and, and uh, not, as, not as ready for others. So mm -hmm. understanding that importance of context. And lastly, just having it, this eye on sustainability and adaptation over time. I want to end before we get to the panelists um, on this next slide, which is around um, new policies here in California. I think we're in an exciting time. We've had, uh, and, and thanks to the roundtable and other groups who have really advocated for, for many of these policies. Um, the first is AB 659. I think this is the first year that it's gone into place where um, Schools are now required to notify um, parents of sixth grade students that HPV vaccination is recommended and that um, they should be fully vaccinated against HPV by eighth grade. AB 1797 is um, requiring all California healthcare providers who administer vaccines to take part in the California Immunization Registry. And then lastly, there is um, the CHW Preventive Services. Um, policy which focuses on Medi-Cal covering community health workers um, to provide preventive services and outreach. So with that, I think I'd love to introduce our panelists um, and really get to um, some of the wonderful work and lessons learned and, and um, case studies of what they're working on in their individual plans. So on our panel today, first we have Doug Morier, who is from HealthNet. He is an epidemiologist and quality analytics program manager. Um, Dr. Morier is an epidemiologist with the quality improvement research and analysis team um, at HealthNet, a California managed care company serving Medi-Cal beneficiaries. He's been with HealthNet since 2015. And prior to that, he was with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health Office of Health Assessment and Epidemiology. Next, we have Marcella DeSantis, who is a pediatric preventive care strategist at the Inland Empire Health Plan. Um, Marcella DeSantis is, um, has jo joined IEHP in 2016 and has held several roles on the quality improvement team, where she has facilitated several work groups focused on improving children's immunizations and well care visits. Next, we have Amanda Kim, who is from the Partnership Health Plan of California, where she serves as an improvement advisor. Um, she has been working at the partnership for seven years in quality with a specialty focus on improving pediatric health outcomes. And last but not least, we have an out-of-state guest. Um, we have Christiane Soltz, who is a women and children's health specialist at CareSource Indiana. Prior to her seven years at CareSource, Christiane worked with the maternal child population in Indiana for 13 years, first as an inpatient obstetrical nurse and later as an OBGYN office triage nurse, utilizing her clinical expertise and advocating for HPV awareness in both the provider and member spaces is something that she continues to be passionate about. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our panelists who will speak a little bit about um, the strategies that they're currently utilizing in 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 their plans um, to promote adolescent HPV vaccination. I can't see them on my screen, but I think maybe I'm just I need to move the spotlight. Is that right, Joyce? Oh, there they all are. Okay, I see Doug. Hey everyone. So I think I'm going to set my timer here so that I stay within my five minutes. And, um, and thanks so much for having me and for all those great presentations. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit um, about HealthNet's, uh, what we're calling our custom HPV measure. 
um, to, to impact the IMA. So there's been a lot of great uh, presentations already about what the IMA measure is, the three um, immunizations that go into it and how those rates differ. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we ended up at HealthNet, um, which as mentioned is a managed care plan here in the state of California with this custom measure that we use. And it basically, it flowed out of exactly everything that's been presented today. So um, as was mentioned, I'm an epidemiologist by trade. Um, I started in infectious disease epidemiology. And so for me, it's really interesting to see how a big infectious uh, vaccine preventable illness public health mandate gets turned into actions at you know doctor's offices all, all over the country um, and all over the world in this case. And it goes through HEDIS and the NCQA in terms of turning that into an actionable measure. So we've got three immunizations that are due by age 13 to the day, right? That's how the spec works. Um, two of them only require one dose. One of them requires two doses. And that one that requires two doses, as Dr. Motz noted, is the one that causes the lower compliance. So what we found is that there's this, um, this thing that happens, and you've probably all heard this expression, working the care gap measure, working the care gap report, working the measure. Um, the, the disconnect that can happen there is that if somebody, if a provider is just using the care gap report as, um, as it's published to include members in the denominator that year, in that rate, that will include continuously enrolled members who are turning 13 years old in that measurement year. And so if they're using this as a tool to organize their work around IMA, then that member is really becoming kind of front of mind um, for those immunizations in the year they're turning age 13. And when it's only one dose, that, that might work okay. And we do see really high rates of the, the other two vaccines, the Tdap and the meningococcal, but we only see um, a, an adequate initiation rate of the HPV. So um, for those who are, um, because IMA is still what we call a hybrid measure, um, I don't know how many plans are doing um, some sort of reason analysis as far as why those misses happen. But if you go and look at your random sample, uh, you will see that a lot of those members who were falling out of time frame, they have that one shot, that one HPV shot. They got that shot in the year of their 13th birthday. So clearly moving the work forward is what's needed. And so what we're calling this um, sort of custom measure is we're basically taking the clinically eligible population, which is starting at age nine, and we're putting it out there through the, the, the data mechanism, the tool that the plants are familiar with, which are these care gap reports. Um, if, if it's a big organization, they probably have data analysis who can do these rollups already. Um, if not, they may still depend on reports coming in some sort of Excel format or some sort of spreadsheet format. So we want to make sure we get it to them in the mode they're comfortable with. We did something similar for COVID vaccine, basically trying to put it out there in the kind of the language that's understood, meeting them where they are and using the existing tools. Um, a lot of our providers are moving to a platform called Coziva, which is great because it sort of does this sort of workflow organization for folks. But really, it's basically getting now not waiting until a member is in the denominator and not working the rate, but getting up to the clinically relevant time frame, which would be beginning at nine years, um, 10 years of age. Um, the, the potential there is pretty significant. Um, going back to Dr. Oliver's slides, I think the, um, the initiation rate was somewhere in about 70%. And the one dose was only about 40%. So there's a potential there if you get that second dose in time frame um, of really seeing a substantial jump, like a uh, 50 to 75% rate increase in that IMA for uh, by virtue of moving that forward. And then the difference that remains might be that um, that hesitancy we're talking about. But by and large, it seems like that gap is actually smaller than just this time frame gap. Um, so we've been working this in programs, generally working at the provider level. Um, it is something that's great for a clinical program. One of my colleagues working um, in, in commercial employer-sponsored um, insurance, working with large medical groups, uh, has found that taking this program out to the groups has been very effective. Also looking at it, um, age-specific rates on a provider-by-provider -provider basis, um, because you can find some physician champions. Um, you will tend to find that there's some physicians who are really, really, um, like Dr. Oliver, for example, really pushing this way of doing it and getting those 9, 10 compliances. And then other physicians in the very same practice might be kind of waiting until the 11, 12. 
Um, so there's a lot of great opportunity. We've had some success in sort of turning it into a clinic-based program in that way with that focus on um, the nine to 10-year-old rate. Uh, I am going to drop a few links in just in case um, you don't have all this information, but I'm sure most of you do. And that is my five minutes. So I will stop. Great. Thank you so much, Doug. Yep. Um, next, we have Marcella. Hello. Making sure you guys can hear me OK. <laughs> Okay, so um, I do have some slides, so I'm just, uh, I'll wait for, I think, Joyce to go ahead and share those slides. All right, thank you. Um, so um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Marcella DeSantis. I'm a pediatric preventive care strategist at IEHP. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I have a lot to get through in only five minutes, so um, I will be going through them very quickly and set a timer for myself. So. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Um, so I just, just to kind of um, orient everyone, I'll go over IEHP overall, um, and then our our performance in that IMA measure that several of the other presenters have measured or mentioned, and then what are some of those interventions and programs that we currently have in place at IEHP um, in hopes of improving um, the HPD vaccination uptake. So um, next slide, please. So uh, for those of you that are maybe not familiar with IEHP, um, we are a very large health plan when it comes to our geography. We serve San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Um, our total membership exceeds 1.5 million members. Um, and we have um, three different lines of business. So we have our Medi-Cal line of business, um, DSNP and also uh, Covered California, who just recently entered the exchange. Uh, the majority of our population is within that Medi-Cal line of business. And within that, children ages zero to 19 make up the largest group within our, um, our membership. So um, IHP is very big on that child and adolescent um, age group. So when we look at our performance, um, I'm sharing just some information about our population in 2023, um, just to kind of give some perspective of how large the population we have for our HEDIS IMA measure. Uh, we had over 30,000 members in our denominator for that measure. Um, I included the counts for each of the different vaccines within that HEDIS measure. Um, and you can see on that table or on that chart that HPV is definitely the largest area of opportunity for us. So um, I shared out what our re final reported rates were. So you can see that for IMA combo two, we were at 37.96%. Um, and then when you compare that to meningococcal, which was seven, about 75%, Tdap 88%, um, and then HPV much lower at 40%. So um, a lot of work to be done in this area. Um, and so we are currently participating in the American Cancer Society HPV Learning Collaborative. Um, and you know, now I'll kind of jump into what are some of the things that we are doing um, at IEHP, starting with our member-focused interventions. So the first piece we have uh, is a member incentive program. So just recently, I believe in 20, end of 2023, um, we updated our incentive program to encourage members to start the HPV vaccine series um, at age nine. And we've updated the, the dollar amount that we offer for that um, incentive. So first we start notifying our members at age nine that they're eligible for a $50 incentive for the first dose. Um, and then they can get an additional $150 incentive upon completion if the series is done by their 13th birthday. So, I mean, in total, they can get $200 for completing their HPV uh, series. Um, in addition to that, we have a member outreach that we do with our member services team. And this is where they reach out to those members that are going to be turning 13 years old and just providing that additional reminder that they may need one more dose to complete their HPV series. Um, and then we also just have that, our community health workers, I know that was mentioned earlier, where we're engaging with school districts and embedding our health navigators to support students and families to close these care gaps, provide education and attending some school-based events. Um, and we also at IHB offer a CHW certificate program to include training our CHWs embedded in provider offices and community-based organizations. So again, educating on those care gaps and, um, you know, how to provide those resources to um, our members and families. 
Next slide. So thank you. Um, and so for the provider side, we have our provider incentive program. Um, so the IMA measure is included in the Global Quality Pay for Performance Program at IHP. Um, so that's one of the, the metrics, and this is one where we're looking at value base. So setting uh, tiered benchmarks, the better you do, the more of a payout there are for our providers. Um, and then an additional component for our PCPs is they get a bonus payment awarded for um, pediatric immunization. So in addition to their, their pay for performance dollar amount, they will also get an, a bonus payment um, on top of that for each pediatric immunization. Um, and then as Doug mentioned, you know, we have our provider reports. So we do have the, the IMA, KEDIS measure, member roster to support our providers and just you know, those that are turning 13. And um, as Doug mentioned, that um, being that providing that proactive um, reporting is something that we just recently started offering over the last year or so, um, having an adolescent immunizations roster to capture members that are turning age nine um, and having a more proactive approach to that IMA measure, right? So you're able to get them in sooner and hopefully complete the series well before their 13th birthday. Okay, and then the last thing on here um, is again, something pretty new for IEHP. Uh, we started an urgent care and wellness quality incentive program. And so this is a program where we're incentivizing our urgent care providers to earn financial rewards for wellness services. And so some of those services include adolescent immunizations, child and adolescent well care visits, fluoride varnish and lead screening. And next slide. So what we identified when doing some root cause analysis of our child and adolescent wellness measures, we found that members are utilizing the urgent care. Um, they may be going to the urgent care just um, out of convenience, availability, um, and they may not be seeing their PCP. So we saw that as an opportunity to connect members to care and close some of these care gaps um, that maybe they were unable to do with their PCP. Um, so we definitely have seen an uptake for some of that um, through that incentive program. But one of the lessons learned <laughs> is that we identified there was minimal to no vaccine administration um, during this time period because we identified those urgent cares were not eligible for, like, they're not BSC eligible. So, um, you know, those vaccines come at a cost to those urgent cares. So one of the things that we're doing to address that is updating our program immunization reimbursement to cover the, more than the cost of the Medi-Cal fee schedule so that we're able to offset that for the urgent cares and, and hopefully get them involved with uh, offering those adolescent immunizations. So I know that was more than four minutes and that was a lot of information, but if there are any questions, feel free to put it in the chat or click them off you. Raquel and I are also um making sure we're monitoring the chat. So we'll we'll have, it looks like, um, good time, um, a good amount of time at the end of this. So thanks so much, Marcella. Um, we'll circle back with some of the questions that are showing up. Thank you. Um, next we have, I think, Amanda. Yes, you're up. Yeah, hi, thanks, Jennifer. So hi, everyone, my name is Amanda Kim. I'm with Partnership Health Plan of California and I'm an improvement advisor. Next slide, please. We are a nonprofit community-based healthcare organization that started in 1994 in Solano County, and we now provide services in over uh, in 24 Northern California counties. Our mission is to help our members and the communities we serve be healthy. And with this thought in mind, my role in partnership for the past seven years has been focused on improving pediatric health outcomes, including adolescent immunizations. Next slide, please. So there's a lot on here. I'm just gonna talk about them at a high level. Um, we have, as it was stated in an earlier presentation, we feel like thinking about what can managed care plans to do to get involved, to help improve rates. Definitely a multi-pronged approach would be recommended. And here's just an example of several of the things that partnership has embarked upon. Um, one is school located vaccine events, which I'm gonna spend a little bit of extra time talking about in just a moment. Um, in addition to just school-based would be community-based vaccine events with partners that are willing and available, partnering with our public health offices to promote specific targeted clinics. So within public health, they may have set vaccine clinic times 
particularly getting close to a back around to school time, we have worked in the past where we have targeted our members within that county to say, hey, come to this specific day and time that we've agreed on with public health. We arrive at the clinic and if they get all recommended vaccines that are offered to them that day, we would provide them with an incentive. So that's been very fruitful. Um, also the educational component. So I've heard about education in general, providing education to providers, specifically providing education to the students or that age group as they are becoming of the age where they can be their own vaccine advocates. So you could do something like an immunization poster contest early in the spring. We've done that in the past where we um, go and provide education launch a poster contest where we come back at, at maybe the back to school night at the end of the semester or during the school day, all the kids vote on the winners, we give out prizes, um, and you can pair that or not with a school located vaccine event. And that's been really uh, fruitful at some of these events, children have come with their parents. And when we've been offering immunizations, the parents are saying, what's, what's off, what, you know, what, what is offered today, or we're only going to get the school required vaccine doses and the kids nudging their parents saying, Hey, no, I learned about these. These are really important. I want to get them all. And their parents are like, okay. Um, so that's been really fruitful. Um, one of the new things that we started just in 2024 is we have our normal pay for performance or quality incentive program where we pay providers for completion of this series by the 13th birthday for our members. However, we've added an additional layer this year where we're providing a, a second incentive that is payable before the year that they're in the denominator for 13 years of age, where we're providing um, a $50 incentive to providers for the first dose if they've got that first dose before the, anytime between 9 and 12 years old, so before the child's uh, 12th birthday. We're also getting gearing up to start a new program where we're doing a reminder for a second HPV dose. So if they've received the first, they're, they're, we, we feel like they're not going to be hesitant about HPV. I believe on one of the recent, within the last couple of months, maybe webinars that was offered by the roundtable, had heard about a public health department back east who was doing a reminder program after they received the first dose. We are going to pilot that um, in, our, in our health plan. Um, one other thing that we've done that to address both childhood and adolescent immunization is to create a local trusted resource within um, several of our counties. We're, we have a goal within the next few years to have it rolled out to all of our counties where we are sponsoring and paying for a local community website that is educational um, about pediatric immunizations. And then in general, promoting those educational opportunities where possible. And again, if a school is hesitant of working with or maybe promoting, a good way to get a foot in the door is to offer to bring a resource or work with the school nurses to provide um, education to the students while they're in sixth grade before they're entering seventh grade. Another way to get involved, if your county does not yet have an immunization coalition, to maybe start conversations to create an immunization coalition. Or if there's one that exists and you're not already involved, absolutely would recommend getting involved. Um, also, there's the California Immunization Coalition that you could get involved with. Next slide, please. So I want to just spend a few minutes talking about school-located vaccine events. And yes, it is a new acronym that I learned of um, in the last few months, SLVE. Um, Partnership has piloted doing some um, involvement with school-located vaccine events for the past three years. And this is a kind of an example of the progression of those events over the last three years. So this was with one particular school. We started in 2022 where in joining a, a local coalition um, identified a school who wanted to join. They were like, we really want to bring vaccines to our school, uh, to our student population. That's something that we have a problem with every year. And I, as a health plan representative, I kind of, uh, served as a, a big role in the first year in 2022 of kind of organizing. I cold called pharmacies. I reached out to our public health department, tried to identify, okay, how, who can come and vaccinate and how can we make this happen? And as uh, many of you would probably be aware, the school would wanted to provide an event that would be free to all students. And so that means regardless of payer. So, oh my gosh, how do, how do we make that happen? Um, the first year we worked with an FQHC and a pharmacy, a private pharmacy that were, was not a VFC credentialed. Um, we were the kind of the safety net payor. If there were any uncovered vaccine costs, we offered to, uh, to fund those. Um, we organized, identified the different roles, brought in the, through the volunteers, worked very closely in partnership with the school to coordinate that one. Moving forward to the evolution of 2023, we kind of did a repeat. It was a Saturday, right? But, uh, 
within a week or two before school started, I would say we, we moved and transitioned or evolved into more of a co-organizer with really um, the school being our co-organizer for the event. Uh, we repeated the funding back up and then we brought quite a few volunteers, including some of our nursing staff who came and, and signed up on, through care to the vaccinating organization and, and actually vaccinated. And then fast forwarded, to 2024. The previous two years, 2022 and 2023, the school would not uh, provide approval, the administration to, to provide it on site, but because of the previous relationship and some change in administration, finally got the school nurses who were really the champions within their school district, got approval to actually bring vaccinations to the campus. So 2024 has really been a, a, a mark year. We were able to hold three events um, at, at three schools during the school day um, in April and May. At the, in the sixth grade class. And within that particular event, we were able to vaccinate over 100 students. And of those, 80 of them received the HPV, which I, for me was the real win. Um, that I think resulted in before the event and before forms went home to get signed up for the event during the school day, the school nurses, we provided um, some education options to the school nurses and they ended up providing education to the students at home a packet and really, really super successful event. So we're super, super excited. Um, I would say challenges moving forward is, you know, finding a scalable model. One of the, the things um, that is a challenge, I think, in many of the counties is to how can we actually make this free? How can we have the vaccine supply? What if, you know, thinking of in, in the world of dreams, what if we actually had an opportunity where VFC would make a stock available specifically for school events where you could qualify with a certain percentage of students being low income to provide vaccines for all? So, sorry, I think I've gone over my five minutes. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, it's just a quick picture of of one of the during the school day events that was held at the sixth grade class um, and some kiddos that were excited. Parents were given the option to come uh, when their kids were being immunized, just as a FYI, um, and partnerships supplied food um, and again covered those vaccine costs. And next slide, please. Would love to talk to you more if you're interested in trying um, something out at your health plan or in your public health department. Um, and thanks so much for having me today. Thanks so much, Amanda. That was great. I loved hearing all about the lessons learned um, and potential strategies for scalability. So definitely, we'll see if there are any questions. Please keep your questions um, coming and entered into the, the chat. We are monitoring them. So last but not least, we have Christiane, and we're so happy that she joined us from Indiana today. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? And I can't see anyone. So someone give me a thumbs up. So yes, you're good. Perfect. Thank you so much. So good afternoon from the sweltering hot Hoosier state today. And thank you so much to ACS California staff for including um, an Indiana health plan in this very important discussion. I've already learned um, so much today from these esteemed presenters. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our collaborative approach that we have taken within the HPV space. But we could not have done this work without our ACS Indiana partners and other key stakeholders within our health plan, such as our quality and analytics team. So next slide, please. So just briefly, um, CareSource is a national nonprofit health plan. Um, we have over 35 years of experience started in Ohio, but we serve members in a growing number of states now, including Indiana. And so in Indiana, we offer the Medicaid plans within the Healthy Indiana plan and the Hoosier HealthWise plan. And then we also have uh, marketplace plans as well. So overall, we provide healthcare to 2 million members. And in Indiana, we serve almost 243,000 members. Um, I've Provided just like a quick, quick look at our adolescent vaccination rates um, from June, we do participate in the National HPV Health Plan Collaborative um, with ACS and in which we, um, it really has helped us dive into our HPV rates more than just the completion rate, which has been really helpful for us to look and figure out where we want to focus our efforts. Um, and of course, these percentages are of children who turn 13 years of age during that 12 month period of June 2023 to May of 2024 and received these following vaccines on or by the 13th birthday. So you can kind of see those rates. Thank you for going to the next slide. 
Um, for time's sake, I'm not going to go read all this slide, but wanted to highlight that what we really did was took a multi-pronged approach. Um, we worked on both member and provider initiatives. Most of these initiatives have already been implemented, but the one I did want to call out um, is this dental provider effort. Um, our dental director here at CareSource is very interested in launching efforts on HPV in the dental provider space. It's kind of an untapped territory um, here in Indiana so far. So um, in 2025, we are really planning to work alongside our Indiana Immunization Coalition to host maybe like a free webinar on HPV in the dental space. And we're very excited about that. So next slide, please. So our efforts in the HPV space really started in 2018 um, with a letter similar to the ones you see here on the screen. So we all know what happened in 2019. Um, so this effort was really halted before it ever got started. So we came back together in 2022 with ACS, um, love them, and all of the other managed care entities with, within the state. And you can see other key stakeholders that we really tapped into to kind of give this approach a strong approach. Um, so we created these um, current, this is the current ones, these parent guardian letters that really focused on cancer prevention for boys and girls and then the effectiveness of starting at age nine. Um, and then our provider letter on the right-hand side really focused on the importance of initiating HPV at age nine, along with um, that missed opportunity between the HPV rates and our Tdap and meningococcal here in the state of Indiana. Um, we really use this letter to target all of our members for education that are entering um, that age nine category, um, instead of just those that fall in the HEDIS measure. Um, so we, we do this by mailing, we may email it, we can utilize this um, as well in provider meetings as a talking point, as we, we already are giving gaps lists, we're giving missed opportunity reports, but really just as a talking point to initiating at age nine. Next slide, please. And this initiative we really wanted to highlight was our H HPV reminder recall letter. So as we were going through and talking to providers, talking to our members, really digging deep into what barriers were happening within the HPV um, space, we, we really realized that reminder recall issues were um, a huge barrier that kept coming up. So um, additionally, personally, with my own nine-year-old daughter um, and our HPV vaccine experience, we had multiple barriers, um, many of which were related to scheduling and lack of reminder recalls. Um, so we know providers are very busy and are often faced with turnover. So we felt like this was a low hanging fruit as we knew these parents were not vaccine hesitant. Um, these children had already received the first dose of um, HPV. So we went ahead, created this letter. Um, we sent this letter um, with our medical director's signature to children who had their first dose, but were late in receiving their second dose. Um, and you can see here, we have only, this just began in October, 2023. So very um, little data to report, but um, what I, basically what we know is that um, we did have the, some children get those, the vaccine um, after the letter was sent. We did wait that three months to look at uh, the claims run out just so we could give some time. So there's a potential that we still will have kiddos go in and get that second dose after the letter. Um, and obviously the letter success rate was based on correlation versus causation, but we were happy to report that, you know, <clears throat> sometimes we don't even get members to open letters or um, open texts or emails. So to us, this was a success and we'll continue doing this and kind of see what, what happens and hopefully get some feedback from both providers and our members. And then the last slide, please. Thank you. This is just a quick overview of some of the other efforts we have available on our website. So we created an HPD toolkit um, and placed it on there. And then we also are working on network notifications to our provider network, letting them know about those on-demand HPD learning series that have CMEs tied to them. We've heard feedback that that's a way to get providers in um, and doing some of this education and be on best practice within the office. So 
lots of other initiatives um, as well, but hopefully you can get these this slide deck and kind of see what else we're doing. Um, with that, I'll just wrap up by saying collaboration has been key with us, um, along with finding those champions within your health plan um, and outside your health plan to work towards increasing those HPV rates. And thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Christiane. And I'm going to, at this time, just invite all our panelists to maybe come back on their cameras. I think um, some of them have been, some of the prior panelists have already been really active trying to answer everyone's questions in the chat. So we love that. We love maximizing this time that we have together. Um, I just want to say this has been a, a super um, wonderful learning experience for, I think, many of us who have joined today. Um, We've heard sort of common themes along the way. Definitely a multi-pronged approach has been mentioned by many of the panelists. Key in all of this is um, finding the right partners and champions. And um, I think also just being creative with who we partner with and who you all work with outside of traditional clinic settings, whether it's um, school located events, community settings, um, and pharmacies. So with that, I'm going to, I see all the, I see all the panelists back. We had one question specifically in the Q&A that's a little bit general. So maybe we'll start with that and then we'll go through some of the specific panelists, um, the specific questions for specific panelists. So the first question in the Q&A is, um, are there recommendations that you all have that can be used for those member groups, I assume, um, that are vaccinating or provider groups that are vaccinating for HPV at a lower rate? What are your recommendations for addressing those provider groups or health groups that are healthcare delivery groups that are vaccinating for HPV at a lower rate? Amanda, yes. Oh, so I would say just initiating with a conversation if you have the time and bandwidth with the providers to kind of understand their current state. I have heard from providers that they are actually hesitant. So we cover a lot of rural counties and there's a pretty strong anti-vaccination sentiment. So I think understanding kind of where that provider is coming from and kind of meeting them where they are and offering resources, highlighting incentives, um, highlighting some of the kind of the, the trends. Like I, I know there's been lots of education over the last few years about, you know, that having a, a very proactive conversation and announcement approach and, and just re-reminding them of the, the, the easy ways that they could implement that, that don't take up a lot more time. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Anyone else? Doug? Oh, yes. Oh, go ahead, oh, Doug. Go ahead, <laughs> Oh, I would just say that oh. <laughs> um, calling back to something Dr. Oliver said is um, so uh, the, one question again, talking about when are you looking? Um, are you looking because a member appeared in your care gap report, which is to say there's this open care gap, in which case you're not um, you, the member is in front of mind in, in like that w week's workflow until they're about to turn 13. Um, and so what's the strategy for starting to look at nine? And then the next question might be, as Dr. Oliver had mentioned, what's the situation with well child visits among your nine to 13 year old cohort at the clinic and, and overlaying the two, um, well child visits, the rate of well child visits declines rather steadily after age six, um, starts nice and high, which is good, but it declines steadily after age six, and then just kind of falls off at age 18 once the member becomes an adult. Um, but if you start earlier, you're going to have a higher rate of annual well child visit. And then that's just an increased opportunity for the, the physician to be interacting with that family. Um, so just agree with everything that's been shared already. Um, again, again, just that provider education piece. Um, and really just thinking about some of the pieces that Dr. Oliver mentioned where you're able to have that conversation earlier on, right, at, at nine years old. Um, it does change the tone of the conversation. I feel like it's, it's more focused on cancer prevention versus sexual activity. Um, and so really being able to, to promote that messaging that this is cancer prevention. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, at IEHP, we also have a lot of our team members that are working directly with our providers to understand what their specific barriers are in their office. 
Um, and sometimes it may be just not even understanding the measure or what, what they're looking for for our reporting, right? So I know for us health plans, we're thinking about the HEDIS IMA measure and it needs to be done on or before the 13th birthday, that's the rule. Um, and if it's after the 13th birthday, then you know, providers aren't aware of that. So just really understanding where the disconnect is and a lot of that engagement with our providers has been um, helping identify what is specific to their location. Is that an anti-vax sentiment like Amanda had shared in some of the in some of their clinics? Um, or is it just really shifting the focus of um, promoting HPV at a younger age? Um, I know a lot of providers are like, oh, I'll just lump it in when they're doing all the other ones, but they're less likely to come back, right? After, like Doug mentioned, they're less likely to come back for a well care visit after that. So if you're able to shift that, that approach earlier, then you're more likely to complete the series before they start to drop off those well child visits. Great, great perspectives from all three of you. Um, this next question, staying on the topic of providers, but shifting to the Indiana experience with dental providers, um, there's a question in the chat on whether um, the connection and the outreach to dental providers is more of outreach or are they providing the HPV vaccine? I think the question is whether, Christiane, you can give more details around that. Yeah, absolutely. So this is an effort that we're hoping to launch in 2025. We are actually currently reworking those collaborative letters that you saw with all of the pretty logos of the key stakeholders throughout the state. And one of the ideas was to get the Indiana Dental Association on board um, because we want to really launch this into our dental provider network. Um, in the Indiana, actually, dentists can provide vaccines now. How many are doing that? Not very many because of capacity and those things. So I think before we ask a dentist to ever provide a vaccine, we really need to educate. I can tell you my dentist does not feel comfortable right now, um, would not feel comfortable um, providing even education. You know, they're in there doing oral cancer screenings, but do they really understand why they're doing that? Do they have a workflow within that office that talks about, hey, did you get your HPV vaccine? This is why I'm talking about it here. That's one more person that can make that recommendation and make a strong recommendation. So I think our goal with this will be to really outreach, educate um, versus having them give the vaccine because we know that's gonna be a huge, huge hill to climb at this point. Um, but yeah, lot, lots of good stuff to, to work on in our dental um, director is a dentist, so she has some buy-in and she's really interested in pushing this effort forward. I think while we're waiting for a couple more questions in the chat, I wanted to pose to the group, I know you all collectively talked about um, strategies in, in non-traditional clinic settings. Any other final thoughts or lessons learned around that? I know Amanda had that great sort of table around the progression and evolution of um, the SLVE sort of experience, but any other thoughts around sort of the, the non-traditional um, outside of the clinic type of vaccination strategies, aside from dental, which we just heard from? I can speak a little bit. Um... Pharmacies is one that we've looked at, um, but there there are lots of barriers because in Indiana, most of our pharmacies, if not all, are not VFC providers. And so that really creates a pretty large barrier. I will say we are working very hard. I know our pharmacy directors work very hard and I think Kroger is on board. And so we know at least we may not have a Kroger in all 92 counties of Indiana, but that will allow some access for our kids to receive the HPV vaccine. I think that a lot of our small rural pharmacies that are independent pharmacies can and do give VFC vaccines. So that's been something we've looked at is really working um, with those rural pharmacies, pharmacists to uh, really educate them and then allow those members in those areas to access um, those services. It's great, great suggestions for policy level strategies and, and, and change as well. Amanda, I see you unmuted. 
Yeah, so um, going to the pharmacy, so the last couple of years, um, we've worked with a VFC, what I'm calling a VFC pharmacy. They are one of the very small handful across California that are participating in the VFC pilot. If you have the opportunity to learn more about that, and encourage other pharmacies to sign up with the qu big qualifier that Lesser Heart, the, the gal who's leading the charge um, with the pharmacy we worked with, really ha is very mission driven. The reimbursement is not great, um, so it would be ha have to be a pharmacy that would also just be very mission driven. Um, also, participating in the local coalitions, understanding like different stakeholders in the community, talking to public health, understanding their if you haven't understanding what is their who do they get vaccines to? Do they bill private insurance? Can they go to private insurance? When they when you guys are really busy, who do you send people to get vaccinated at? One of the things I learned recently is that a lot of medical patients um, are had previously been getting their back to school vaccines because of the um, fullness or unavailability of, of getting in our local county have been actually paying out of pocket to go to private pharmacies to get their vaccination. So they're paying for it, not getting covered by insurance. And then um, the VFC pharmacy, she said she's been getting influx in because she's going to places and they're like, oh, well, if you go to this VFC pharmacy, you can get your vaccines for free. So she's had a kind of been overwhelmed with that this year, but being creative, just having, having local community conversations. Oh, yeah, so How I, did I um, oh, <laughs> go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> That's all right. So, I, I mean, I, echoing uh, Amanda's sentiment, the, the pharmacy piece is, is great, you know, trying to find a way to incorporate our pharmacies. Um, into that work, and, and that's something that we had done in the past. And again, it was um, a challenge, right? If they're, if they're not EFC eligible, um, and, and really getting their buy-in. Um, so I think that that is just something that we're continuing to explore and looking at how do we overcome those things. Um, and then other things that we're looking at are just what are other additional sites of care? So where are our members going for care? So you know, like I spoke about the urgent care incentive, right? They're going to urgent cares. Um, to get lots of other services and maybe just other, um, it may not always be like something that can get, they can still get a vaccine during the visit, right? And so, or they can complete these other components of a well care visit during that visit. And so what are other ways that we can kind of close those care gaps while you have the member in front of you? Um, and then also looking into um, mobile um, PCTs, right? So we have a lot of, um, there's been a lot of discussion at IEHP about contracting with a mobile PCP so that they are BFC eligible PCPs, but we can leverage that, that mobile component to have them present at an event um, and, and being, being able to reach those members um, and get them their immunizations at maybe outside of the provider office. So um, just some other, some other things to consider. Wonderful. I know we're, we're coming up on time and I want to let Raquel ask the last question um, and then perhaps move on to some of our resources. So Raquel? Yeah, I was just kind of summarizing. There's some discussion in the chat about um, the importance of, of education around not just nurses, but staff that may be running immunization clinics, just patient facing staff. So um, the question is about the engagement of a non-clinical office staff, if anyone has any other comments on that, any success stories, um, because yes, we definitely talk about that as being really important to get everyone on the same page at the practice um, about the importance of HPV immunization and working mm -hmm. together as a team. Any other comments or anecdotes on that front? I can give a personal experience on that. When I that was one of the barriers that I encountered <clears throat> encountered at my child's nine year old visit was when we went to check out after her first dose. She said, "Okay, we'll have you come. I need to schedule you in three months for the next to bring you back in for the second dose." And we kind of had to do some education. I'm like, no. Um, but also, she's like, "Well, unfortunately, our provider." Um, our provider schedules are not out that far. So I cannot schedule you for that. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, she's like, so you'll just need to call back and, um, you know, for that second dose appointment. Luckily, I am a healthcare provider and will bring my child in for their well child visit. So it was going to be okay. And we usually have a med check appointment in there at some point. But what that brought up was ensuring one that 
what we can do as a health plan is use some of those toolkits that ACS has is wonderfully putting together, I know, for our health plans um, and has launched just recently, but usually pulling some of that toolkit out. Okay, can we help? Can we co-brand something that can be a reminder recall for that non-clinical staff to one, learn a little bit about that HPV vaccine, when to bring them back in so they don't have to feel uncomfortable, especially if they're new, because we know turnover. So is influx in those uh, in the healthcare space right now. So doing that, really talking about reminder recall, um, talking about why it's so important to have, you know, that reminder for in the workflow for providers as they're seeing patients as they enter an age nine and, and all those things that can be done. So I think it just highlights the importance of pulling out things to make it easier on the providers um, that you're working with. Um, I, I would say one thing, um, when we're talking about some of the, the rates, um, in California, at least the, a member is going to be assigned to a physician or to a clinic, usually a safety net clinic. So when we're rolling up rates at the provider level, we're rolling them up to the assigned physician. So then that does obscure the, you know, the rock stars in the front office and in scheduling who are actually making the whole show happen. Um, and it, therefore it takes a more, uh, qualitative work, non-quantitative work to get in there and figure out exactly what's making, um, the assigned providers rates look so good. Um, and so that's tough because, yeah, I do think that that deserved credit can't be put front and center, um, the way we would like it to. Um, but in terms of then, you, you know, what would make it happen with some other heat is measures that we work with when you're, when you're booking, when you're scheduling, it's sort of clear based on age or demographics or health needs that something else has to happen in the course of this visit, that something else might be a cancer screening that you know is going to have to happen. Um, or if it's a, if they're younger, if they're a baby and they're on the bright future schedule, you you know what other immunizations kind of neatly fall within that three, six, nine, 12 month um, bracket. So I think getting that practice such that when, when the parent of an, or guardian of a nine-year-old calls in, um, you know, I'm scheduling this appointment. This appointment needs to have a, a dose of uh, HPV on hand because that appointment comes with this. And and that kind of gets into that sort of presumptive. Um, uh, for, will someone remind me of what the term is? The uh, presumptive uptake, presumptive adherence? Recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> Different ways to say the same thing. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I will throw in one other quick one. Marcella, $200 seems like a lot for a member incentive. I'm wondering, um, and maybe there can be some comments in the chat for those that are using member incentives, um, like how that compares to, to an average amount. Is that typical or did you all go go hard into that strategy? Yeah, yeah. we did. <laughs> it is a lot. Um, and and I mean, that's pretty new for um, IEHP. Hi. It was not that dollar amount before. Doing? Uh oh, I do hear some me? background noise. We'll work on muting that. Please mute yourself. Sorry, go ahead, Marcella. That's okay. Um, so yes, that that's pretty new. I believe we started offering that end of 2023. So um, it's um, still we haven't had the opportunity to really evaluate like the effectiveness of increasing the dollar amount. Um, but that's just general feedback that we had received from our members. For a lot of our member incentive programs, a lot of them are about $25 um you know for a one visit right um with hpv being two at least right um to complete the dose the series um we increased the dollar amount and we identified that that was a really big area of opportunity for us so you know we we increased the incentive amount so we'll have to wait and see uh, you know how that pans out if we do see some improvement in that hpv um in in that measure um but yes it is it's a pretty lofty dollar amount. I don't know what other health plans are offering, um, but it was a pretty significant increase for, for our program as well. Yeah. We'll be interested to hear how, how that goes. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Sway, for being our uh, presenter and moderator and to each of our panelists. What a great lineup we had. So glad that we had um, time for a fantastic discussion as well. We are going to close the panel and go back to our deck. And thank you, Doug, for posting that quote from Dr. Oliver. Yes, I think that's a fantastic point to be kind of closing on 
um, that the the not so exciting things done consistently, you know, and, and continuously really, um, really do work. And we'll, we'll keep getting um, the increases to get us to our goal. And that leads me very well to the first resource that we want to showcase. There's a lot of resource slides. I'm going to move pretty quickly and remind you all that you'll have access to this deck to use as a uh, reference for some of these resources. But there's there is definitely a lot um, available, including this very exciting uh, guide, health plan guide for uh, action guide for health plans. And this is one Christiane was just mentioning. Hot off the press, just been a couple of weeks. Um, a really exciting resource for specifically for health plans, kind of written in your language. And again, a lot of those tried and true methods are in here with resources to support that. Um, so kind of some examples, it includes tips to form an HP vaccination team, make the business case for HPV vaccination to secure leadership support, promote a cancer uh, prevention narrative, making sure we're sticking to HPV vaccination as cancer prevention, so important. Um, promoting vaccination at age nine, of course, is front and center in here, and then implementing both provider and member-focused interventions, and there is um, some great resources for that. And you'll see in this call out here, um, coming soon will be a communications toolkit for plans. Very highly anticipated. It's going to have things like sample emails for and letters for providers, uh, case studies, text message samples, phone scripts for office staff, a standing order template. We've talked about how important standing orders are, so it'll be a template, um, messaging for parents, lots of goodies in here. So that'll be coming out Um and we'll make sure to, to let all, all that are connected with us as a roundtable know and we'll let you know how to do that. Um, then we have our, oh, a couple of the panelists mentioned participating in our American Cancer Society National Learning Collaborative um, around adolescent immunization. This is a 12-month quality improvement project to increase HP vaccination rates. Um, and we do have, so it's technical assistance with an American Cancer Society staff person. And then there's also quarterly calls with health plan participants across the nation to share uh, resources and successes, challenges, lessons learned. Um, so really great opportunity. Our availability for this opportunity in 2025 is still pending, but um, if you're interested, please do reach out to us. You can reach out at info at cahpvroundtable.org. That's on a future slide. Um, and we will keep you in mind for that. From our National HPV Vaccination Roundtable, this is just a collage of the many things available from the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable. As a California Roundtable, we um, you know, don't have a lot of resources, so we're not creating new collateral or disseminating what's out there. And this is a, a great resource, um, including the action guide that was just mentioned. Next slide. Another resource from the National Roundtable and other partners, um, is this on-demand provider education series. So it's a six-part series. It's free. Um, the CME credit on this just expired. So uh, the CME no longer available, but the content remains posted. And this is actually just a really great, um, it's very comprehensive for provider education, six different modules that can be taken um, self-paced. So you'll have access to this. Um, another opportunity, a National Rural Disparities HP Vaccination Learning Community. This is for any stakeholder that with an interest in driving HP vaccination rates in rural areas. So it's applicable for you all as health plan team members and also for provider groups. It's it's uh, kind of halfway through, um, but can, can absolutely be joined um, on an ongoing basis this year. And of course, we've got lots of great resources from the CDC. We have some examples and the landing page. And then on the next slide, if you're looking for a, a parent landing page, um, the cancer.org backslash HPB from the American Cancer Society is a great one just with parent facing language. And um, these are some of the parent handouts that are available there as PDFs as well. And then now shifting to some California specific uh, resources and opportunities. So again, this forum today is brought to you by our California HPV vaccination roundtable. You see our website listed here. Some of the, I should say that this website's under revision, but some of what you'll find there are our data analysis reports. So we've been doing annual analyses on HPV vaccination rates um, using our, our registry data, our care data. Uh, by county, so you can find that, and also the HPV cancer rates by county, which can be really helpful in mobilizing stakeholders as well. 
We also have a whole suite, and I'll show them on the next slide of, oh, okay, great, of our California HPV Vaccine Week materials. This is our, it was, a, it was the first week of August. It's our annual campaign that the Roundtable puts on, a public awareness effort, and we have um, survivor and physician testimonials, ready-to-go assets for social media and um, messaging for use in, in the various ways that, that you message to, to the community and to your members and providers. So we make that all available for you. And it is it's certainly, you know, it's not just for use during that week, it's for use ongoing. Can you go back to the previous slide just for the remainder of that list, please? Um, really quickly, the HPV 101, there's a train the trainer deck presentation for community health workers that our parent work group has put together. So you can email us if you have an interest in that. Um, and then there's also a our membership application on there. Pretty simple uh, way to get connected with us as a roundtable. And I'll talk about the Learning Collaborative in a second. Go on. Yes, thank you. Another thing that our um, provider work group does is leads announcement approach training. So we heard about that from Dr. Oliver. It's been referenced a couple of times, the presumptive recommendation or um, announcement approach, really the same thing, um, this uh, strong, effective uh, provider recommendation, and then ways to address um, questions, ways to address hesitancy. Um, excellent training that we're able to offer virtually with um, our tr great trainer, um, retired pediatrician, Dr. Irene Landau, and we are actually have plans to be able to train more providers to be offering this. Um, so if you're interested in this, please reach out to us to schedule an announcement approach training. I should say also roundtable experts are available to assist with the request for provider educate other needs like more general trainings, HPV 101, start at nine as well. Next slide. And uh, our provider work group also puts on a quarterly learning collaborative. Um, you can sign up on the website. This is an opportunity for you all to participate. You can also promote participation to your provider networks. The next session in October is on HPV vaccine misinformation and hesitancy. Next slide. And then put this in the chat earlier, but as it relates to AB 659, the Cancer Prevention Act that Dr. Sway mentioned, um, we did put together some um, templated provider newsletter content. We were also excited to use that content as a starting point for this branded letter that you see here with AAP and California Academy of Family Physicians, California Immunization Coalition and CMA as well. So thank you to CIC for your work on that. Next slide. CDPH resources, probably some of these look familiar to you all. Great resources. And then that on the next slide, a hot off the press opportunity from CDPH. This is a CDPH grant. The RFA just came out yesterday. I actually just got the email today on improving vaccine confidence. Um, so please share this, take a look, share it with your networks. Next slide. All right, just a quick word on how to get involved. I know we're right there on time is uh, please, please join us. You can become a member at the CaliforniaHPVRoundtable.org. There's also a spot on the evaluation to indicate interest. You can join a work group or become a general member and members will receive that registration information for our December 4th annual meeting that's coming up. And please, before you move on with the rest of your day, take a few minutes uh, in the chat, you'll see our evaluation to complete our evaluation, share what you thought of today's content, what you want more of, um, so that we can stay engaged with you. So a huge thank you to our planning committee that put together today's program, to our speakers for sharing your time and expertise with us today. And a thank you to all of you as our participants for making the time in your busy schedules to join us. We hope that you're leaving with some new ideas to drive this important work. And we hope you'll stay connected. We wanna be able to hear about and showcase your work, um, your health plans efforts. So we've got this vaccine that prevents six types of cancer. This really is a life-changing work that we're all doing. We see you. We thank you for the many roles that you're playing in advancing HP vaccination in the state. And together, we can create the first generation free from HPV cancers. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.